Welcome to a world of thinkers, dreamers, and doers. A place where intellectual curiosity and active research accelerate entrepreneurship and innovation before bringing them into being. This is the Roberto C. Goizueta Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Within Atlanta's vibrant heart, the center is a nexus for the Goizueta and Emory community, serving entrepreneurs to investors, students to startups. This is an intimate environment where connections are easily made and relationships are readily built, making the center a microcosm that offers macro opportunities. This is where you'll find a cultivated entrepreneurial ecosystem, bristling with possibilities that foster partnership with the business community surrounding us, a growing, unique network of businesses and organizations. Tomorrow has to start somewhere, and we're defining the future right here. Don't think of it as an idea incubator as much as a curiosity super collider. The center blurs lines across disciplines, programs, and areas of expertise, serving to connect ideas to resources, founders to mentors, and the classroom to the community. And while great minds think differently, this is where they come together, uncovering intersections of entrepreneurship and innovation that elevate business while bettering society. We meet our community of entrepreneurs and innovators where they are, and then empower, educate, and inspire them to get where they're going. It all starts here at the Roberto C. Goizueta Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Welcome to the third in a series of panel discussions in recognition of the launch of the Roberto C. Gazueta Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. I'm Rob Kazanjan, academic director of the center and professor of organization and management. The creation of this new center represents an expanded scope and elevated commitment to entrepreneurship and innovation at the business school. And we're grateful to the Gazueta Foundation, which generously supported it in their 2019 gift to the school. The center has three areas of focus. First, entrepreneurship, the support of students and alumni in the launch of their new business ideas. Second, investing, the development of competence and connections and support of financing the growth of new businesses. And thirdly, innovation, the focus of today's panel, providing opportunities to study best practice related to innovation in large complex organizations. Across these areas, we run a portfolio of programs ranging from Pitch the Professors, where students get support for their early ideas and business models, to the Startup Launch Accelerators, where those with promising ideas can validate their customer demand, all the way up to the Raise Forum, where, we, we, uh, where more established startups can pitch to angels and VCs as they seek the funding to grow their, their venture. Uh, I very much, much want to thank the a team that's made the CEI possible. Um, there are a team of four of us plus support from student fellows. Um, I'm going to give Amelia Schaffner a fuller introduction in a moment, but many of you may be familiar with, um, uh, with uh, Andrea Hirschhatter and Charlie Getz. Uh, both are my faculty colleagues in organization and management. Both teach the entrepreneurship credit courses. Uh, Andrea has been here for uh, pretty much the, the, the last 30 years working on issues of innovation. She also uh, is the Senior Associate Dean for the BBA program. Charlie's been here for 20 years and probably has touched every student during that time period that's even had an interest in thinking about entrepreneurship. So they're both very critical to our efforts. Um, and then uh, of course, um, uh, we have student fellows both BBA and uh, MBA, who uh, in our case, these five fellows will be graduating this May and they've been indispensable to our efforts. Uh, I wanna make a few announcements quickly before I introduce Amelia. Um, we uh, would like to ca capture your questions. We'll leave a few minutes at the end to take questions from the audience. If you could please post your Q&A in the Q&A section so there's a, a little tab at the bottom where you can post your questions there. In the chat, you can find links 
to one, our LinkedIn group. If you'd like to be kept aware of the activities of the center, uh, you can click there to join. And then secondly, at the end of our session today, around 5.30, uh, we're gonna run a, a networking event for anybody that's interested in doing it. We use a platform called Mixtros. And uh, once the session is over, you'll be able to access the link there and sign up and then be connected to four or five others just to talk about the, get to know each other and talk about the topic. Um, so Q and A for questions, chat for the links that are of importance. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Amelia Schaffner. Amelia is director of entrepreneurship programs. And those programs cut across all three of the pillars of entrepreneurship, investing and innovation. Uh, she's been at Gazueta for three years. We all feel like she's been here longer. She's a dynamo, gets lots done. She's played a pivotal role in the expansion of our program. She's broadened outreach to students and alumni. Importantly, she serves as primary lead to our connection to the ecosystem broadly in innovation and entrepreneurship across the Southeast. Uh, Amelia joined Gazueta after more than a decade at Accenture in the strategy practice where her last role was strategy principal and global innovation initiative lead. Before that, she spent time at Merrill Lynch doing financial analysis of startups and an international business development in her home country of Italy. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amelia. Amelia, welcome, um, and we're on to our panel. Great, thank you, Rob, for that introduction and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is very exciting for us because we're getting started on the third pillar uh, that Rob mentioned, corporate innovation. So it is my pleasure to welcome Jason Wow, Nicole Jones and Sid Hoda, who are all three graduates of Gozueta. They graduated in the MBA program, different programs, uh, MBA for Nicole and Sid and, and for Nicole and Jason and EMBA for uh, Sid. Uh, I'll read their brief bios and then I'll kick it off to them to tell us a little bit more about their journey. So Jason Wilde is a Senior Vice President of Transformation and Innovation at Salesforce, uh, the most innovative company in the world three years in a row, according to Forbes. Uh, he's responsible for the Ignite program, a collaborative and transformational approach to innovation and co-creation. And prior to joining Salesforce, Jason was director of worldwide client innovation for IBM, which includes innovation discovery. Nicole Jones is global innovation leader for Delta Airlines here in town in Atlanta. Uh, in this role, Nicole oversees the Hangar, Delta's global innovation center. Her team explores innovation and ideas that harness research, design, and technology to improve Delta's customer experience and operational performance. And prior to joining Delta, Nicole held positions uh, with Warner Media, Macy's Systems and Technology, and PwC. And then lastly, Sid Hoda is a principal on the AWS Digital Innovation Team, where he works with the customers to help drive digital transformation and innovation across their organization. And he joined AWS from Crate.io, which is an analytics database startup, where he served as president and chief commercial officer. And previously, Sid was the CMO of three other startups, and also worked for Cisco in a variety of management roles. So it's my pleasure to introduce all three of our guest panelists. I will kick it off to them to tell us a little bit more about their journey. Maybe tell us how you got to this role and how some of your previous experience kind of informed how it, this particular role. And let's start with Nicole. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicole Jones. And um, a bit about my background is I have a little over 20 years of experience in corporate America. Uh, I began my career, I like to think of my career in four phases. Uh, I began in technology. Uh, so I was an IT consultant with PricewaterhouseCoopers. I also uh, worked at Macy Systems and Technology, helping to lead really the e-commerce aspect of, of both of those businesses. Um, I then went, um, moved on to, went to business school. And after business school, um, I went on to Warner Media, where my focus was really strategy and um, new business development. Uh, from there, the digital revolution uh, sort of did a comeback. Um, and I decided to uh, take a position at Delta. And I began my career at Delta in marketing, where I spent 
a little over uh, four years in marketing before making the switch over to innovation. Uh, the way I think about that career path is, you know, the first three phases, if you think about technology, strategy, and marketing, when those three come together, that's really the core of innovation, right? It's knowing who your customer is and how you market to them uh, and what's their sort of loyalty and intention to buy. It's um, building a strategy that keeps them loyal. Um, and gains their business over a period of time. And then it's building technology and tools to attract them to your product and your service. Um, so that, that's really my background and I'm happy to be here today. Um, look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Jason, will you tell us a little bit more about your current role, and how, how you got here in a, the innovation route? Of course, well, um... Thank you, Amelia. Um, it's, it's an honor to participate in something like this. Um, I graduated technically in another century with my MBA from uh, Goizueta. Um, and that was kind of a cute joke, but no, I don't know, it's a long time ago. Um, and uh, um, actually the first class in the new building of uh, the Goizueta Business School. So just congratulations on just an amazing community that's doing so much regionally you know, globally, and it's an honor to be a part of this. So I spent the last 20 years of my career at two companies, um, IBM and Salesforce. The last uh, eight years at Salesforce, when I joined Salesforce, there were 6,000 employees. And we just finished our last fiscal year with almost 60,000. Uh, and uh, so my role at Salesforce has been to lead a global um, innovation team. Uh, it was founded by our chairman and CEO, Mark Benioff. And basically the idea was to partner with our most strategic customers or clients um, and invent and co-create their future. So I, I've had the privilege of leading, including my time at IBM, customer transformation projects, innovation projects in 38 countries. So pride myself on kind of having a global perspective when it comes to innovation. And my favorite, I think you asked, um, you know, if there were one word that uh, I would want to associate myself in my career, um, innovation would probably be in that conversation if it's not the winner. Um, but my favorite uh, definition of innovation over the years has been find the wow and when you do scale like heck. Um, and if you do one well but not the other, you're going to fail. So um, look forward to getting into the conversation and to be a part of a great panel with Sid and Nicole. Thank you, Jason. And that's a big, uh, tall order. Find the wow. <laughs> I will remember that. Thank you. And uh, on to Sid. Tell us a little bit more about your Thank you. Um, uh, whoops. Am I, yeah, am I not muted? Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, back in around the year 94, I thought I was a pretty smart guy. But then I went to business school and I realized uh, I'm even not as smart as I thought I was, but I got a lot smarter back in 96. I went to business school at Lenox Mall. The EMBA program was just borrowing from space before the new building was built. So I'm really old. It wasn't even a building yet. So I, I go back pretty far. Um, my career, as you, as you heard from, um, you know, about my experiences from Amelia, is a mix of both startups and big companies. I was at IBM out of college for a number of years, Cisco for quite a few years, uh, and now at Amazon. In between there are a bunch of startups. And in between there, um, one of the things that the EMBA program did for me, part of the EMBA program was you did um, about two weeks abroad. We went to uh, Thailand and to Hong Kong as part of our, our, our studies. And that really created a bug in me that said, I've got to go work internationally. I had just this passion. I had to go do this. So since then, I've had a chance to go to expat assignments in Japan, in France, and in India. And so my career has been across continents, across sizes of companies, and over time, gaining some wisdom and over time, realizing how much you don't know. And, um, and how did I get here? You know. Um, at Cisco years ago, I was looking at three different jobs and one of my mentors, who was a very senior guy at Cisco, um, I asked him, which what job should I take? This one, which is pretty powerful, this one, which is intellectually interesting, or that one, which is kind of an, an area of unknown. He said, don't worry about titles. Don't worry about prestige. Go work on the team that you will learn from the most, that excites you, that makes you even more passionate, and go work on something that really matters to the company. The company's success depends on it. So forget about the fluffy stuff, worry about those two things. And since then, frankly, that's what I've done. And that's how I got here, is I've worried about people I work with are the people I 
really can learn from. Um, is it what, I, what I'm doing important to the company and does it matter? And so that led me to Amazon, which has been a, a fantastic ride, really smart people and uh, just so, so much to learn. Um, innovations in our blood. Innovation is something that we, um, have start, innovation started our company and everything we've done that you've heard about since then, AWS, for example, and Prime and uh, Alexa were all as a result of innovation processes. Um, the way I think of innovation from a definition point of view is, is very simple. Finding answers to old questions, finding answers to new questions, and finding answers to questions you haven't asked yet is how I think about what innovation kind of is or what innovation does. Um, and so that's a lot of what I do for a living today. Well, thank you. Well, one common denominator, obviously, you all have is passion and that route on how you got here to your roles is a very crooked route, but essentially, you know, it's following that particular route. So no panel on innovation would be complete if we didn't talk about what you actually mean by innovation. Some of you already covered a little bit of it, and I'd love you, of course, to expand on that. I mean, searching for innovation right now, you can find millions and millions of entries, but I would like to start with Nicole because I did not hear Nicole on how she thinks about the word innovation. It's such a vague term for some people. So Nicole, kick us off. The way, the way we think about it at Delta is really just never being satisfied with the status quo. Continuously uh, in, in being incremental, adding more value to the customer experience and delivering on what customers need and want. Um, an example though of internal innovation is five years ago, Delta made a commitment, uh, an investment at Georgia Tech. And the investment there was because, you know, we've historically been in a very competitive industry. Um, a lot of times we hold a lot, a lot of things close to the vest. And so although we've been innovative for many, many years, we didn't really talk about it as much publicly. And so this investment in, in Georgia Tech was an opportunity to invite the uh, academic community, to invite uh, students to innovate along. As you all know, Atlanta is just a great sweet spot um, which is exciting that Emory is launching uh, this program. It's a great sweet spot uh, for innovative talent. And so, you know, that was just the first step on our innovation journey. Um, but we've since then expanded uh, to do a lot of great work with students, with startups, uh, with the entire um, community in Atlanta. So really excited to now expand that with uh, this new center at Emory. Great. And I don't know, Jason, if Sid and Sid, if you want to expand a little bit more on those definitions in addition to what it means to you, what it means to your company and, you know, to stakeholders outside. So in general. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll go first and I'm, I'm sure Sid will have a great perspective. Well, you heard my definition. And uh, I think one of the big brain turns that I had was when I was with, at IBM and I held, held multiple roles at IBM and kind of started my career as a consultant and learned the power of data gathering a bunch of data, analyzing it with a microscope and cutting it with an ax a million different ways and really activating that left side of my brain. I think what I realized over time, especially being in a technology company was the, the power of empathy and emotionally connecting. Um, the technology is really, really important, uh, but it's just an enabler uh, to change hopefully business operations, society in different forms. Um, and another thing at IBM that I learned was this amazing brand, global presence, IBM didn't have an access problem. Um, so it wasn't necessarily coming up with great ideas. It was, how do you go from whiteboard to reality? And so, um, I don't know if you know this, but IBM invented the relational database and invented the wireless router and invented the core technology behind LASIK surgery. Um, Cisco, Oracle, um, and many other companies made nice multi-billion dollar businesses out of monetizing those ideas. So I think the big brain, big brain turn I had was creativity, invention is part of innovation, but innovation is more than that. Uh, and uh, that it has to add, add value um, or it's just a great idea or it's a great concept. And it sounds very, very simple, um, but um, I think a big misconception is, is that innovation is about coming up with ideas that are new to the world. I think as Sid was alluding, there's all sorts of different innovations. And I think that wow, finding the wow um, can be 
a way of changing a process in logistics, it can be a wow of, wow, there's a new way for us to get to Mars. Um, and it follows that whole spectrum. And actually less than 1% of like true impactful innovation are ideas that are new to the world. So I think, you know, it was that other learning of the importance of kind of being an orchestrator um, and appreciating history and knowledge from untraditional places as well um, and making it tangible. And when you can make something tangible, you can put technology in the hands of someone who's maybe non-technical um, and you get them to see that, oh, this is real or it can be real. Um, Literally, I've seen people almost fall out of their chairs. So I think for me, innovation is all about not just novelty or inventing or being creative, but it's applying to something that can change the way we live, we work, right? And we interact with other people. And that comes in so many different sizes and, and, and shapes. Yes, thank you. Exactly. It's kind of translating um, and um, uh, connecting the unconnected. Um, thank you. Sid. Just to build off uh, what Jason said, actually, um, for me, innovation is not about, um, it's less about wow, though. It's more about solving something, making something work better, make life better, make something easier, safer, whatever it is. So I think the, I think the, 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 the false def definition, um, I think, um, conversation is around new and interesting and um, crazy ideas. Um, crazy ideas were, um, were really grounded in that they were trying to solve a problem. And so like in our company, we don't have a chief innovation officer. No one's job in the entire company of Amazon with a, a lot of employees includes the word innovation in their title, really. It's, innovation is not, not a goal. It's not a goal at all. The goal is to solve problems, a customer problem, an employee problem, a supply chain problem, whatever it is, and um, finding a way to do it. And if you can do it with a very simple straight line from point A to point B, great. If you do it through a zigzag and, and algorithms that are complex with machine learning, hey, that's fine too. So I think the thing about innovation for me is it's not about the, the glory gets the attention, but the value is about solving a problem, making it better, making whatever you are uh, experiencing better than yesterday. Um, and, and that's innovation. And sometimes the, the boring innovation doesn't get the notoriety, but it delivers a lot of the value. Thank you. And, and speaking of which, it sounds simple, but it's not, like I said, it's complex. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the barriers you've encountered. First of all, how have you weathered the pandemic, right? How has your company uh, adapted and changed? And, you know, what, what's next? Uh, and the speed of innovation that we're going through right now, even over the last one year. Um, again, let's go maybe around the room since Sid, you just finished. Let's go back to Nicole. Sorry, uh, I, I can switch the, the route next time, but. Uh... No problem. Um, and so our strategy at Delta is always to put people first. So the pandemic um, has really not changed that at all. Uh, we have continued to put our customers at the forefront, put Delta employees at the forefront and our focus on safety um, has not wavered at all during the pandemic. And so um, from an innovation perspective, I'd say the biggest change has been, we might've had a, a longer time horizon uh, previously that we were focused on. So maybe it was three years out plus. Um, and now it's how do we get customers comfortable with the fact that airline travel is safe and that Delta is the, should be your airline of choice uh, when you're ready uh, to, to fly again. And so that's that's been our focus. Um, also putting our employees in a position where um, they are also kept safe. Um, and so we are the only airline to continue to block middle seats. Um, and we found that customers uh, really do appreciate Delta's focus on their safety. Um, so that's really been our focus um, always and especially during the pandemic. Thank you, Nicole. And, and have you found that the speed at which you are required to do these innovations has, has also accelerated? Um, yes, because it's near term, right? So if we're, if we're delivering something in, you know, two to three months, 
versus something that could be, you know, more of a 12 month engagement over time. Yes, we've absolutely had to deliver a lot faster. Um, but the beauty is we were prepared for, for this. Um, not that we knew this was coming, but we work on minimum viable products. We work using a design thinking methodology that offers uh, us the ability to think big, start small and learn fast. And so because of that, we've been able to deliver uh, with speed. Thanks, Nicole. I'm going to revert the route and go through Sid and then to Jason. Let's talk about barriers, uh, Sid. So in terms of our innovation priority or approach hasn't changed in the pandemic. We were doing the same thing we we're doing yesterday, solving problems, finding a better way to do something, a more efficient way, a um, way that customers will love uh, versus tolerate. <laughs> so that hasn't changed. What changed to the pandemic is the world around us changed and forced execution to happen faster under very unusual conditions. Um, so therefore, how we might test something, how we might, um, you know, I would say logistically deliver something, of course, there were more constraints and it was harder. Um, and thanks to a whole lot of, you know, really passionate employees, uh, we were able, able to pull it off. But I don't think, our, I think anything changed, frankly. And I, that's one of the one of the beauties of a, of a true innovation embedded in the culture of a company is that, yes, there was a pandemic. It was a, one of the craziest times in our lives. Something else will happen in a year or in five years, or in 10 years. Look at Texas this week. They've had some challenges. There was, um, where I live here in the Bay Area, we had fires uh, going on. And so th things will always happen in the world. And so I think if you build the right kind of uh, innovation culture and approach to customer, um, I would say centricity, um, you can adapt and you can deal with these things as they come and, uh, and, and navigate this isn't the last of the storms we'll experience, right? We all know that. And so I think in our case, we just uh, you know, moved a little faster, but didn't fundamentally change how we do business in any way. Thanks, Sid. And Jason? Yeah, sure. So I guess uh, I'll try to answer both the barriers and then what happened to Salesforce and a little bit of uh, what we learned through this process. Um, there's always barriers, right? And uh, I think for us, we're a company that really prides itself in having strong values and living our values. Um, you know, lots of organizations have plaques and mission statements and posters in their headquarters. Um, we're an organization and we have lots of different mechanisms and ways that we try to really operationalize our culture. Uh, and those values are trust. After trust, there's nothing more important than that. And right? it takes sometimes years to build up trust. And when you think about it, regardless of the business that you're in, products and services come and go. It's really about relationships. So I think being centered on trust and the relationships that result from that trust, I think helped us prioritize in whatever we were reacting to and where we had to be proactive. Um, and the other values, customer success, innovation and equality, innovation is a corporate value. And we feel it's the responsibility of everyone in the company, regardless of their tenure, their level. Um, we as a company, we were born in the cloud 1999, digital native. Um, and, it, you know, we feel like we've got deep empathy and design thinking in our DNA. Um, and the ability to kind of activate those insights, if it's normal times or fast changing times, but activate those insights on top of a platform, I think was also very interesting. I think for year, years, you've heard people talk about, maybe you've heard people talk about become a platform centric business or business model. And it's like, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, I think the advantage for us was going a time machine back to March of last year, 2020, we couldn't spell contact tracing. Uh, we were all in the middle of this craziness that we were hoping would be a sprint, but it's turned into a marathon. And after kind of launching as a concept, something that Salesforce calls, we call work.com, to so six weeks after we literally kicked that off internally, we had a bunch of new products software, tools, apps that were available through work.com. And it's amazing, 35 US states are using, um, you know, there's several Canadian provinces, multiple companies in private sector. And this isn't really a commercial about Salesforce. This is really about when a platform centric business is able to morph and shape shift its value proposition and do it at speed. Um, you know, we were able to help so many businesses, small and large. And it came from a place of feeling responsibility 
these companies literally couldn't do business. So how do we help them get back into business? Well, we leveraged our platform because Salesforce forever has been about CRM and building customer relationships and managing those relationships. Um, so I think that was the big change. We kind of burned through our plan that we had going into the new year pre-COVID in like a couple of weeks. And we did some deep soul searching around what do our customers need? How do we make them successful? And how can we activate maybe an under leveraged side of one of our assets uh, and take to market something completely new? So one area that I think that's really interesting is the whole realm of decision-making. Um, I remember a few years ago, I think it was IBM, annually they do a CEO survey. And one of the nuggets from that survey, I think it was 2016 that stuck with me, was CEOs admitted, two out of three CEOs admitted they were making significant decisions with insufficient information. And when I saw that, my first kind of reaction was, yeah, and the third one is lying through his or her teeth. Right? They're making big decisions every single day. And now you get into COVID and it's a bit like operating a business, operating an organization when you're shrouded by fog. You don't know what the next day is, what's going to happen next week. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity to move from art to science, us as an innovation community, to leverage more data um, and enable really significant decisions. And I've always felt that every decision is a hypothesis, but it's been amazing to see our own organization and other organizations really suffer at the speed that's needed. And I think you read Hastings, the founder and CEO of Netflix said, it's his objective to make the smallest number of big decisions possible in any given week. And this world has forced a lot of people, personally and professionally, to make decisions that we weren't prepared to make. And I think that's a whole realm that's gonna be a space and a canvas to innovate around decision-making um, and doing it in a way that at scale and experimentation and data that we just couldn't imagine a couple of years ago. Yeah, thank you, Jason. On our last panel, we heard one of the entrepreneurs say that data has all the correct information, but doesn't tell the whole truth. So interesting to see how are you uh, all three kind of weaving this decision making into your innovation decisions. Maybe can you tell us a little bit more about how you think about innovation at your company and how that relates to the bigger strategy, right? You just talked about um, making these bigger decisions. And so, Jason, if you have anything else to add, otherwise I'll go around and sort of go to Sid and then Nicole next. No, please go ahead to my colleagues. So I'll just, uh, uh, how does, how does, um, how are these things going to connect? Our mission in Amazon is um, to be the world's most customer centric company. Now, on one hand, that sounds pretty bold and big, like, well, what does that really mean? That sounds so grandiose. Uh, it, it's big and that it doesn't limit our thinking. We don't necessarily frame and try to stay in one lane. On the other hand, it is very grounded in the sense that when we think about innovation or ideas, the customer is the center of the ideas. The world's most customer-centric company. That's our mission. So everything we do, innovations that we that we bring to life are are, are, are very heavily geared toward what the customer needs, wants, will love. I don't like using the term minimal viable product. Minimal viable means that you, you know, it's a C. Minimal lovable product means that you actually like using it and you and you favor it. And 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 that and that matters. That difference matters to all our daily lives. So how does this relate to innovation? Well, nobody innovation doesn't start with an idea. It starts with a customer. And in the context of that customer's life, is this person in a car? Are they at, in their home office? Are they flying somewhere um, on Delta? Are they um, eating? Well, what are they doing? What is the context of the customer? What do they need? What's happening? What does the unrealized need? Uh, if we did give them this, what happens? So it's very, very customer focused. And the question we always ask about bringing back the data, because look, we all know data can tell you whatever you want it to tell you. Go read any political article you want in the world and Anything you want to prove, you can prove with data. Data doesn't do anything in that sense. But the question we ask is, how do you know this is true? How do you know? 
And that's a really important question to ask is how do you know? And a combination of both qualitative and quantitative answers. But I think for us, what, I, what, what you know, where this sort of comes together and what in, in the grand picture that you asked about Amelia is that um, the mission of our company um, drives how we think about innovation and where innovation starts and how innovation is measured and what innovation is deemed a success. I mean, it all comes from that mission and it's very tightly connected together along mechanisms we use and processes and me metrics and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And Nicole, do you want to add a little bit to that? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I mentioned earlier Delta's focus on putting people first. Um, innovation is no different. So we, our practice is really human-centered design. So before we really start to brainstorm ideas, we get to know the user first. So my team is responsible for delivering solutions both on the customer facing side as well as within the operation. And we partner and collaborate with the subject matter experts across every business unit at Delta to get really great insight into not only the actual user of the solution, but all of the people that surround them. And as much as possible, we try to do that in the native environment. So, you know, if we're, if we're trying to get information about customers and their onboard experience, a few members of my team will actually go and fly and, and speak to customers and get those insights. If we're building a solution for pilots, we might uh, fly jump seat just so that we can get those deep insights in the native environment. So, you know, putting people at the center of innovation at the core of our business is just a continuous thread throughout Delta. Thank you, Nicole. Can we pull the curtain behind the secret of how you run innovation at all three of your companies? I think a lot of our audience would like to know maybe how you're organized, you know, if there's a group that runs innovation, is it top down, bottom down, you know, how do you make decisions, uh, you know, and, and how if you have an actual way of developing ideas. So maybe tell us a bit about the innovation engine at each of your companies. Um, and I'll let you choose who wants to go first. Well, maybe if I could just build on and add, because I really liked uh, what Nicole and Sid said, um, you know, about the uh, um, the role of innovation and specifically data. And then I'll, you know, talk a little bit about how we're organized. I think um, we've all heard it for years. Organizations and people feel data rich, but insight poor. Um, I experienced this firsthand at IBM. Um, very successful people running multi-billion dollar businesses. Uh, and, uh, but there was not enough data um, uh, when important decisions were being made. So they were very emotional, tense conversations, as you would expect, right? A lot at stake, a lot of responsibility. Uh, but then seeing kind of data start to surface and inject itself into that, you know, what was meant to be a more collaborative decision-making process. And, and it was remarkable to see the behavior and culture change of the conversation kind of moving from, oh, I've got my data, you know, you have your data and, you know, let's kind of get into an argument to now, okay, this is the sing a single version of the truth. This is what the data is telling us. Now let's put our time and energy into what are we going to do about this? And it sounds very, very simple, um, but at the core Salesforce is trying to help organizations be smarter um, about knowing their customers. I can't tell you for how many decades I've been a consultant and I've worked with many large companies that talk a big game about knowing their customer, but you scratch them a little bit beneath the surface and like true customer intimacy that they've earned, um, it's very, very rare. Uh, so I think um, data is all about asking the right questions and be, writing, be ready when you ask a good question, it leads to other questions. Um, and then that should inform you know, what data do you need um, and what data do you need to surface, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've always asked myself kind of a philosophical question in general, which is what is the purpose of business? And I think, you know, Milton Friedman um, and his Friedman um, doctrine has kind of dominated a lot of business books and business schools, which is the purpose of business is to provide a return to shareholders um, on Wall Street. And you know, at Salesforce, we feel like um, a new model is required. We're not the first to come up with this. Klaus Schwab was the founder of Davos, World Economic Forum, actually just published a book titled Stakeholder Capitalism. 
Um, and Salesforce feels like we're one of, not the only, but one of several pioneers. Um, and this feeling that the real purpose of business is to help lots of different stakeholders and constituents, not just your customers, not just your shareholders, the community you serve and your broader ecosystem, including you know, nature and the environment. So we take a very expansive view of the role of innovation. Um, and of course it starts with customer and the customer is at the center of everything we do, but it's a yes and. Um, and how do we innovate to improve whatever it is that's important to our stakeholders and to our, our business admission in a much more expansive set of, of kind of stakeholders. And, uh, and we kind of simply look at it, the shoulds and the coulds. What should we be doing? And try to measure those in terms of KPIs um, and performance metrics and identify those very, very quickly and efficiently in closing those, but also what we could be doing. And we've got different mechanisms to innovate in both the shoulds and the coulds. And the coulds I think are tougher because any organization, especially as it grows and it gets bigger, it tends to promote managers who are really good at identifying and closing performance gaps. So one of the big challenges that we faced is how do you create an environment that's more conducive to adjacent spaces, new ways to create value. And the way we've tried to do that is focus less on the what to innovate, have the right questions and make sure people are focused, but really focus on the plumbing and infrastructure and culture around how to innovate and make that very much outside in and bottom up. Where the role of leadership is not, oh, find the really bad ideas and sunset and kill them as efficiently as possible. But let's flip the lens and make the leaders empowered to feel like their job is to identify the really good ideas, um, remove those barriers so that they can flourish and scale. So some of the ways that we approach innovation organizationally, there's a chief innovation officer, but he has a very small team. And the philosophy is basically to make everybody else successful and to scale design thinking methods. Do things that, you know, he and I share this belief that we kind of have two roles, remove friction and insert friction. And the magic is having the right intuition to understand when and where we exercise kind of those two modes. Yeah, thank you. That's that's wonderful. Remove friction, insert friction. I, I love that. And, uh, you know, Sid, do you want to share a little bit about how you remove or insert friction? <laughs> Well, you've actually unveiled you and you unveiled our processes earlier this uh, a couple of weeks ago with our, your guest speaker, Bill Carr. You wrote a book called Working Backwards, so you got a nice preview of the inside of Amazon. We um, we uh, uh, have sort of four foundations of, our, of of how we innovate, how we remove friction, et cetera. Um, our culture, mechanisms we use the architecture of how we build our company and then organize organization for four uh, ways we do this. And um, I'll focus it on one part called mechanisms. We um, use a mechanism called working backwards. This is how we created this thing called AWS. Didn't exist in uh, 06, now it's the, you know roughly in the 40 to $50 billion range of revenue. Um, this thing called Prime, this thing called Alexa, this thing, you, know, you name it. Working backwards was the approach we use. And such a, such a simple concept, simple, simple is um, you know, at the surface, complex when you go deep. And what is working backwards? It's asking customer questions that sound so simple. Who's the customer? I do workshops all the time. And when I say, we're gonna have a one hour discussion on who the customer is, people say, oh, come on, we know who the customer is. We, that's like five minutes. It's never five minutes. It's never five minutes. It's a lot harder than it sounds. Who, um, and so when you get into the deep customer questions and really have, a, 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 I think, a serious conversation across multifunctions, not just engineering and product, but also customer support and uh, sales, et cetera, you, you get rich in the bowels of the customer conversation. So uh, customer questions lead to ideas. They lead to ideation. Um, and when, when the ideas come to life and we're, we test them and we debate them and we, and we sort of think about them, then we do something called a PR FAQ process. We write the PR. So we say, let's pretend this idea works. What would our customers say about it when they use it? What would our partners say about it? What would our employees say about it? So we literally write the story before the idea has any real legs yet to sort of the aspiration. And, and, and what's important, there isn't the artifact of the PR, but it's the process, the thinking, the, the, the debate that happens. 
we're not thinking big enough. Or maybe this is not realistic, but the, the conversation that accompanies that is absolutely fascinating. Once you write a PR, you do something called the FAQ. What are the questions people are going to ask? How do you buy this? How do you return it? How does it work? All the questions that people think of. And so this process called working backwards um, is it, the, the, the mechanism that we use to do a lot of things in Amazon, internal innovations, external innovations, and we've used them to create a lot of the services and products that you guys hopefully buy uh, and hopefully use uh, today. But in itself, so we, we do workshops and we do this with customers, this process. Here's the challenge. The process itself only works if the culture of the company and if the rest or how it's organized are aligned. And so we talk about things like failure is okay as long as you learn from it. Is it true? Uh, in our case, we've had some really big failures, and and from Jeff Bezos on, we've said we like that's part of the part of the journey. Um, uh, and if and if you know things like that are sort of weaved into your culture, then these mechanisms work. If you use the mechanisms without the proper culture in place, without the proper metrics in place, then it's superficial. And so for us, the foundation of four is is how it sort of the, all this works. And one of the one of the key um, tools is this thing called working backwards, which which you you, you uh, heard more about, um, which we use constantly, constantly in our company. Thank you, Sid. I, I'd love to see the behind the, the cockpit for Nicole. What does that look like? <laughs> yeah, so what I'd add to that is um, what I found over the years is that, well, so Delta is really good at kind of knowing what our challenge is, what our customers want, and then quickly working towards solving for them. But in some cases, we didn't really spend the time to clearly define the problem. So understanding um, how that customer might react um, in their native environment, um, doing the interviews, understanding all of the stakeholders surrounding that, that scenario. Um, and so I think that's probably the greatest impact that the innovation team has made on the organization over the last five years is providing uh, the business units with tools on how you go about um, empathizing with the customer, understanding what their needs are, uh, clearly defining the problem before you dive in and start to brainstorm solutions. Um, so that's, that's really been key for us in how we uh, do our process. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Um, I know uh, I want to leave some space for questions from the audience. I had a, a whole long, long list of other questions I wanted to ask you, but I want to be respectful. And I know I want to bring on Rob and see if he's seen any interesting questions from the audience. Otherwise, I certainly have another half page of questions to ask you. Yeah, sure. Let me, let me offer a couple. Um, one is I just want to give um, a shout out that uh, Nicole got from one of the participants, Alex Michael wrote, I just uh, wanted to say that I've, I've only flown Delta since the beginning of the pandemic for the reasons Ms. Jones stated. So thank you for taking the steps that you've taken to emphasize safety and peace of mind for the traveler. So you guys are noticed for all those efforts. I just wanted to be sure that got out there. Um, you. You've partly talked about this, but there's an interesting sort of line here and, and maybe I can set a little context. You know, we all see this pressure inside large complex companies where some people have really intense operating pressure on efficiency, do your job, get it done effectively. And then there's this whole set of things. If I see an interesting new idea, it's more of an innovative task. So um, one question is, um, it, where does somebody start, especially in an organization that doesn't have a dedicated innovation group? How do you get buy-in? And I'm going to tie it with somebody else's question about saying uh, sort of, have you seen interesting or unique funding models? So I, my guess is there's lots of people, lots of companies see a good opportunity, have a good idea, but they don't have the time to work on it. They don't have the funding to work on it. Do you have advice for people like that? So we don't have a we don't have a chief innovation officer. Innovation is not a, a group, a function, or a title in our company. Every employee is expected to to, to um, in some way participate in the process, think of it, um, and and be a part of it. Frankly, and it's hard, as you said, uh, Robert. You got a day job, but where does this come in? <laughs> and 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 to be honest, many of the innovation successes have come from doing your day job, finding something's going on, and. It, 
it just it's taking longer than it should. It's not working as well as it should. There's a dissatisfied customer in the process. Whatever it is, it's you know we 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 hire we say we hire builders in our company. And builders, people assume builder means someone who writes code. It doesn't just mean that. It means anybody who likes to solve problems. And whether you're a sales rep or you're in marketing or you're in code writing, you're a builder mentality. So our employees are expected to do things or to help raise awareness of things that aren't going as well as they should. Now, um, sometimes these employees themselves just write a a paper, right? It was called, we called it a narrative, right? A paper. It's like, here's a problem. Here's some things that we could do about it. And sometimes those problems become businesses. They become businesses. <laughs> AWS is one of those examples. That is how it started. It started literally with a piece of paper saying, we have this uh, idea, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't, uh, we feel like you, you can't program innovation. You can't say, all right, now you got two hours, start innovating guys. Or you're the chief innovation officer, you go do it. No. No, it, that, it's very superficial. It, it, it is, it, the, the company needs to think of it and have it in their blood. Um, innovation comes from all parts of a company, especially people who touch customers, especially people who touch customer service, for example. They hear a plenty of feedback, <laughs> you could say, from customers, good and bad, and they solve problems. So for us, I, I think that um, uh, it, it, your day job and the job you're talking about, Robert, is, uh, is very tightly woven to where innovation comes from in our company, which is really trying to make things work better. Get rid of friction, as, as uh, Jason said earlier. That's perfect. Friction is, friction, we all hate friction. We, friction needs to be removed sometimes, um, and sometimes it can't, but where it can, how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, uh, Rob. I, I think what I, I would add to it is that, uh, I mean, there's will and ability. If you're stuck in an organization that has very low will, to innovate and want to change. I mean, that go work somewhere else. I think before COVID, honestly, um, maybe organizations could get away with it, but I think uh, it's, it's almost no longer becoming optional if you ask me. Now, a less flippant answer would be one of the keys, I think to the little bit of success that I've had in growing a team of 200 innovators worldwide is align with the business priorities of your internal stakeholders. Um, right, understand what their top three priorities are. And if you don't agree with them, then you know, develop a point of view with a small mountain, doesn't have to be big, but with some data to support your position to say, hey, here's something that's not one of your top three priorities that should be, and we're here to help. I remember working on a project um, and someone was a bit frustrated because they you know, got a new job. You know, he used to manage a very large team and he complained about, you know, I'm an individual contributor. And I was in this meeting where the CEO basically said, what are you talking about? You have 10,000 people across this organization uh, that you can activate. Uh, and, uh, and it, you know, I think that was really powerful to say, you know, find the coalition of willing, maybe not 10,000 people, but find 1% in that organization who maybe empathize, experience the same pain, see the world or the problem the same way you do um, and strengthen numbers. There's a reason why it's a cliche find those people who are willing to go shoulder to shoulder with you um, and work on it. And then all of you that are you know, graduating or the ones who have graduated, I felt that many of us pay for other people's sins as we're trying to pitch innovation to business leaders in the many, many years of the overhype of value to business from innovation and technology. There's something really powerful about putting something that's real and live and tangible in their hands. Even if it's a low fidelity proof of concept, there's lots of smart hand-waving consultants and brains on sticks. When you can connect with them emotionally, but then you can also say, hey, a few of us nights and weekends, you know, worked on this problem and it's in procurement. Why procurement? Well, if design thinking can change procurement, imagine what we can do in you know, redesigning the multi-channel experience. Oh, well, that's really interesting. What did you come up with? Well, this is what it looks like as an initial conceptual design. And you put it in their hands and quite often, not 100%, the reaction sometimes we would get is, wow, I've been dreaming about this for years. Uh, where have you been in my life? So I think prior, align to their priorities, find other people to build that coalition of the willing um, and come up with something tangible. Get out of PowerPoint and create something that you can put in their hands. That's great advice. Yeah, Amelia, I'm going to give you the last question because I think that covers most of what was in the chat. 
Yeah, no, I think uh, we were just going to ask you also a little bit of advice for those who might be wanting to enter, you know, innovation related routes and careers. Obviously, you shared a little bit about of your bio, uh, but, you know, any advice for those wanting to go in uh, corporate innovation? I would just say be a continuous learner. I mean, it, it sounds simple, but it's extremely important, especially in the world of innovation. Um, and, you know, the, to the earlier question around, you know, not having an innovation group, not knowing where to start, um, I believe that it has to start at the top. Not that the, the person at the top has to tell you to go innovate, but the person at the top has to really believe that innovation adds value to the business. And so figure out what, their, what the key priorities, what the strategies are of the business, what are the problems uh, that the business is trying to solve, build really clear problem statements um, that help you really understand deeply what the problem is, uh, get to know your customer, and then get the buy-in you need from the senior levels. So, um, and don't give up until you get it, would be my opinion. Love it, wonderful. Any other advice from you, Jason and Sid? And then just before you answer the question, sorry, I'm just gonna quickly pop in with the logistics. We're going to go after this into small networking groups and we posted a link in the chat. So please welcome, uh, you know, joining some of these groups after a few questions, you'll be split up with four or five other people and can meet some others in the community. So thank you for that service announcement and I'll let you guys close a little bit with a little bit of advice, Jason and Sid. So I'll, I'll just add to something, and actually, uh, Nicole, you spread this thought earlier when you were talking about innovation at Delta. Um, very, you may, guys may have seen this. Albert Einstein said, um, if I had one hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes making sure I understood what the question was. That is really good advice. And that's the thing, and I'll be a little provocative here. When I was a new MBA, I didn't think like that. I thought I spent it was the opposite i had all the answers i had all the ideas and i assumed i knew what the question was and i didn't it took me a long time and i had a whole lot of failures and fell down many times to realize you know i should probably rethink this and flip it around so i think if you my advice is start thinking like that start thinking about the question start being a good listener and a good question don't you don't need to be the idea person you should be the muse the ideas come from everywhere. The, 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 and the, I think the great thing about people like Bezos in our company, Benioff in, uh, in uh, uh, Salesforce or Bill Gates or you name it, these are legendary business executives. They weren't always the idea guys. They weren't, but they, they were the muse or they were the facilitator or they pushed, they did different functions. So, so you don't have to be the idea person, but you should be good at listening at having empathy with the market or the customer you're trying to serve. And you should be able to ask questions and listen really well. And I'm sure in your courses, you've already seen this video, but one of the videos that I make every, whenever I do a workshop with a customer, I make them watch this video. It's one of my favorite all time videos, which is Jobs Be Done by Clayton Christensen, which has been played a gazillion times. It never gets old. It never ever gets old. Because if, if you watch that video and you watch it and, you, and, it, and it inspires you and you get excited about it, you should get an innovation. Uh, that's great, thank you. And Jason, do you want yeah, to? Yeah, very quickly, I think, um, ask great questions. Be world-class at asking good questions. My favorite question that I've, I've had over the years is what would you never say about X, whatever it is? It's kind of a double negative. Uh, two, be good at storytelling, um, great stories, it, you know, it's, in human history, they go viral. Um, and it's been that way for thousands and thousands of years. How many people, how many times have we seen somebody up on a stage, a virtual stage, and they have the same content and you're looking at your watch and you're bored to death. Uh, and the same content, someone else tells a story and it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Be really good at storytelling. And I think finally design thinking. I think, you know, diversity is really important. I don't want any awards. My team is half male, half female. I think any innovation team needs to represent the world that we're serving. It doesn't make it easy. Um, the magic happens from this creative abrasion. Um, and uh, it's a responsibility of all of us as innovators to create these heterogeneous environments. And I think you know, any university, I know Goizueta's on top of this, any team, any organization, 
should be creating ambidextrous teams, left brain and right brain. You're not born with creativity, right? Scientific studies have disproven that. Creativity is the result of behaviors and rituals. Therefore, the good news is you can develop those muscles, but you have to go to the gym and roll up your sleeves and work on it with your teams, virtually or however you can. You can't delegate going to the creativity gym. Um, so thanks for letting me be a part of this and with this great panel. I appreciate all three of your time. Thank you, Jason, Sid, and Nicole. You've been wonderful, great insights, and we hope to stay connected with all of you. I'm sure you will be reached out by some of our audience here. So thanks again for sharing some of the uh, innovation knowledge from your companies. And if you want to join us, you're welcome to join us on uh, some of this networking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.